Hey folks, Craig Levati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bone Zoomcast. Today's episode is really special for me. We are talking to Dr. Patrick Wood from LifeGift. That's lifegift.org. They are the organization that handles organ donation here in the state of Texas. Hey folks, Craig Lovati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This is, of course, the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. Uh, I am joined. Uh, well, she came back. I'm excited. Cat Hagen in the back. You can't get rid of me. Not I know. You took last week off, and it was just me and Johnny manning the ship, talking to Dr. Scott E. Solomon from Rice about becoming a Martian. And I think we realized that uh, we're all going to stay here. It's I little... told you that was my game plan to stay on this planet. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a terrible idea. Yeah. Johnny, Johnny may go, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick around over here. If I go to Mars, I'm just going to be pushing a broom or something. So I'm <laughs> just going to stick around. Uh, today's show is really special. It's a, it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And it's a topic that I think that everybody in Houston needs to know about. Anybody in the world needs to know about. Uh, we're talking about organ donation and we're talking with uh, Dr. Patrick Wood, and he is the executive vice president and the chief medical officer with lifegift.org. That's the website, LifeGift. And uh, doctor, thank you for, for jumping on the Zoom with us. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, this is a really interesting subject for me. I want to take every opportunity to educate the public and to encourage people to you know, get on the registry so that the more we can educate people, the more likely they are to sign up to be a donor and to save lives, because that's what we're all about. Uh, and medicine is to save lives and uh, organ donation specifically uh, saves lives because virtually everybody that's waiting for a transplant may die of their disease if they don't get an organ in time. And so uh, we believe that our mission is to offer hope uh, to the donor families who are suffering a catastrophic loss uh, of their loved one and have something good come out of that, which is to help a bunch of other people. Uh, and for those recipients that are uh, wait waiting on the list for a suitable organ, uh, they don't have any hope if they don't have us out there looking for organs for them and their, their teams to transplant them. So uh, this is a group effort, uh, and uh, LifeGift's job is to recover those organs and to get them to the appropriate recipients and then just continue to support the donor families basically forever. Uh, we continue to work with the donor families because their grief is ongoing. Uh, and I think you mentioned earlier when we were chatting uh, – it's really fun when we get the recipient of the organ back with the donor family and mom gets to listen to her son's heart beating in the chest of a, another person and knows that part of their loved one lives on. And so <clears throat> that legacy is amazing. And uh, at least 80 to 90 percent of people that donated when asked would they donate again, if given that option, they say yes, because they felt it was part of the healing process for them. So. Yeah, I was, uh, we were talking earlier, you know, my grandfather uh, back in 2008, he passed away and it wasn't until he passed away, he was 77 years old and uh, he wasn't until we, he passed away that we realized that he was a donor and he died of a brain aneurysm and he was brain dead. And then, you know, we sort of found out, you know, through the doctors at Methodist, they're like, oh, wait, well, you know, grandpa, you know, he's, he's a donor. And I was really excited to hear about that. And not to get too flowery about this, but he was always a giving person. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, on his dying, you know, on his dying day, he was going to keep on giving and giving Correct. and giving and giving. Yep. Yeah. He, he ended up, I believe uh, we had to push back his funeral arrangements, the services, because he was so popular. He was, mm -hmm. people were procuring things from him. That's the, that's the word you taught us procuring. Yep. And uh, I think I was like, I think there was a uh, skin because there's three different types of donation. There's organ tissue and then there's living. living. Mm -hmm. And organs, it's obviously stuff internal. Then there's tissue, which is uh, corneas, skin. Uh, is there a whole variety tissue? of graphs. Skin, yeah. bone, corneas, uh, muscle, uh, tendons, uh, blood vessels. Uh, a single tissue donor can help up to over 100 people with different graphs uh, that exist. That's yeah. amazing. He was, yeah, he, he was a pretty busy, popular, popular guy there for a while at uh, – it was just really special to, to know that he, he kept on giving. And that's why, you know, everybody after everybody in the family, after he passed, you know, we all signed up to do that. And I, and I still now, you know, I have the little 
heart thing on my, on my ID. And I know Kat does too. I do. I was going to ask him, how does one go about that? If you're not signed up, if you are not currently a donor, or you don't know if you're a donor, what is the process? And is it, you easy? can go online, you can go online uh, and the registry in, in Texas is the donate life registry uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and you go online and you can sign up for which organs you want to don donate at the time of your death. Uh, whether you want to be a tissue donor, whether you want to donate research organs, and it'll take the average person who's not old like me, it might take me 20 minutes, but it'll take the young person uh, about 10 minutes at the most to uh, sign up on the registry. What do you define just, as young, just out of curiosity? Anybody that's not as old as me. Oh, okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. I sort of do the same thing now, too, as I age, but sorry, do go on. Well, let me let me jump in and just say, you know, you said your grandfather was 77 and half the audience is going to say, well, that's too old to be a donor. And it's not too old to be a donor. Our oldest organ donor that we've had was 93 years old, who was able to donate a liver because the liver has the capacity to heal itself and regenerate <clears throat> so that that liver uh, was perfectly fine. The, the kidneys and the heart, probably not from a patient of that age. And our youngest donor was a premature infant. Uh, so they weren't even theoretically born yet. Uh, and so there are no age limits uh, as far as who can be a donor. Uh, and sometimes people say they don't want to sign up because they're old and their organs aren't any good. Uh, but sign up and let us make that decision because there's a desperate need for organs out there. And things that we wouldn't have considered, you know, 20 years ago now are routinely recovered. Uh, and uh, as I say, no age restrictions uh, and no disease restrictions other than things like active cancer or something. But in uh, most cases, we're going to look at somebody and see whether there's any viable organs because, as I mentioned to you guys before, you know, 22 people a day die on the waiting list simply because we can't find them an organ. And the five-year survival rate for most organ transplants is in excess of 75%. Wow. And if you consider that 100% of those people would probably have died uh, on the waiting list if they didn't get transplanted, that's pretty remarkable. And that's way better than a lot of the cancer therapies and things that are, are out yeah. there. So. Uh, not only do we want to get people to survive, but we want to restore them to a good, excellent quality of life. And that's really the goal here is to get them back to being the way they were before they had a sick liver or a sick heart or uh, were on dialysis. I don't know if it's just me or not, but I know when I signed up uh, after after my grandfather's experience that uh, I started to want to take better care of the parts, the, the extra parts that I have in me, yep. and, you know, and it was more of like, you know, you would, you would, you, you realize that this stuff is not going to be, it's not going with me after I die. Right. And so yeah. I'm excited to, you know, make sure that my lungs are good, whatever, whatever that I can offer up, you know, when, when I shuffle off is tip top for those folks. That's a great segue, Craig, to a question, and it, it comes back to something you said that, you know, let us be the judge of that. Are, is there a situation in which you would take an organ that was a match, but maybe not ideal forever as an interim thing to keep somebody alive waiting on a, a better? It depends on how sick the recipient is, you know, that's waiting for the organ. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, obviously not every organ is is ideal and there are some that are not quite ideal uh, basically based on the circumstances of the person's life as you were just bringing up mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's better to get a kidney that works for five years than it is to stay on dialysis where you have a 30 percent chance of dying each year after you know while on dialysis so yes we use less than ideal organs uh, we try to get the best quality organs for the patient because not only do we want them to survive but it shortens their hospitalization and gets them back to that good, excellent quality of life much faster if the organ function is good immediately. And so we do watch that. And if we don't think the organ's good enough, we won't recover it uh, in that circumstance. And the transplant program won't transplant it. So uh, I don't want to scare anybody saying we're using bad organs. That's not the case. Okay. But there are some that are less ideal than the other ones. Right. Yes, exactly. It's a good way of framing it for sure. Um, so younger, younger, a younger person's organs, if they were healthy, are probably the more viable, I would assume. Yeah, you know, there are certain age limits that we kind of look at, you know, if the, the donor's above 50, we're going to be a little more suspicious about the heart in that circumstance, you know, but uh, in general, that's a decision we want to make. We don't want other people making it, uh, and we don't want the, even the physician in the hospital. We want them to refer it to LifeGift, let us evaluate, and again, 
somebody who's dying on the waiting list of end stage heart disease may get a heart that is less than ideal so that they can survive. Sure. We don't do it with the prospect of having to retransplant them. We want them to do well long term, but if they do need a retransplant, that's always a possibility. So but they're alive to have that. Yep. What I, this is one thing that interests interests me, and hopefully that Dr. Wood can can enlighten us on this. So, say that somebody dies at the hospital; they die at one the Texas Medical Center. They pass away. They're 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 clinically brain dead. What's the next steps after that? Does somebody give you guys a call and say we have this patient here? They're a possible candidate. What's the what are the steps after that? I've always been interested in that. Okay, the, the whole story is that anyone who dies in a hospital has to be reported to LifeGift, no matter what the cause of death is. So that's a federal law, and that avoids people get, the donor potential donors being missed. Right. Uh, if it's a patient on a ventilator who is in the process of being declared brain dead, neurologically dead, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then that patient is referred to us, and we will do a preliminary evaluation of that person to see that they don't have any factors that would rule the patient out. Uh, the, the only rarely things that we look at, you know, active cancer would be probably a rule out. Short of that, there are very few other things that we automatically rule individuals out as potential donors. We want to evaluate and see, even if we're getting one kidney, uh, that's better than not getting anything. And so in that circumstance, so <clears throat> the, the referral is called into life. If we have a communication center that gets thousands of calls a day, as you might imagine, with all the people that die, uh, Worse in the COVID epidemic uh, as we're going through, which I'm sure we'll want to have some conversations about COVID and the organ donation. Yeah. <clears throat> but that referral is made. Then we send a coordinator to the hospital to evaluate the medical record and to talk to the healthcare team. That's the preliminary screen. And then usually they will be on the phone with myself or one of my other medical directors. And we will make the decision that we're going to pursue this individual for donation provided that the healthcare team then declares them dead. Uh, life gift can't be involved in the declaration of death process because of the conflict of interest. So that is all done by the other team. Uh, and then we take over the management of that individual once they're declared dead. And we <clears throat> work to maximize the organ function so that we can maximize what we call the gift. We want the gift to be maximized, meaning we recover as many organs as possible from that individual. Uh, and that expands the gift. And so we... A single brain dead organ donor can save up to eight lives with two lungs and each lung could go to one individual person or both lungs may be transplanted into one person. A heart obviously it saves together and only one person can be transplanted with the heart. The liver can actually be split into two parts, okay, and two people being transplanted from one liver. Uh, each kidney recipient usually only gets one of the two kidneys, uh, and but sometimes we put both kidneys in the patient if, as you mentioned before, they were less ideal then. Two kidneys add up to much better kidney function than one kidney that's not as good. Uh, and then there's small intestinal transplantation and uh, pancreas transplants. So eight lives can be saved, from, saved with a single tissue, I mean, a single brain dead organ donor. I had no idea about intestines. That fascinates me. Everything else I sort of was aware of. How long is the uh, intestinal um, it's been around for 12, probably 20 years, you know, but there aren't a lot of people that need an intestine transplant. You know, they're most commonly patients who have had a trauma or something where they've damaged the blood vessels to their intestine, you know, from the trauma and have to have their entire intestine removed. Uh, they would be a candidate. Many times it's kids who uh, end up with gastroschisis, which is part of their belly wall doesn't close. Mm -hmm. And so the bowel is outside the abdomen and sometimes it gets damaged. And so it's not at all uncommon to do uh, kids with uh, intestinal transplant. Uh, and the expanded thing is that some of those kids then need multivisceral transplant, which means you transplant more than one organ at the same time. And you may take out the liver combined with the small intestine and the pancreas and transplant that as a block into that patient uh, if they need all three of those organs. That is fascinating. It's come a really long way, but obviously. So the and then for that's the organ part of the side part of the things there and then what about tissue what's what's the protocol for that any anyone who dies in the hospital can be a potential tissue donor uh, when that death is called into life gift we actually call the family back and it's remarkable that getting a cold call after your loved one has just died yeah. uh, from our communication center thirty five percent of people say yes the tissue donation which. It's about 75% in organ donation, but even in tissue, although that sounds low, 
it really isn't considering the circumstances in that, no, that, that person. Uh, organ donors have to be in an ICU on a ventilator and the operation is done in the hospital. Tissue donors, actually the body can be transported to our office and we have three recovery suites in our office where we do tissue recovery in our office. Uh, we also get tissue donors from the medical examiner. If somebody's killed in a car accident and ends up the medical examiner, they will decide whether that person needs an autopsy or not. And they might give us permission to recover tissues before the autopsy. And then they do the autopsy after, or they may do the autopsy and we recover tissue after they get done with the autopsy. How long is the tissue viable? Outside just, of that's what I was going to ask, tell you, okay, that if you are unrefrigerated, meaning the body is not kept in a cool environment, then you have about 12 hours to recover the tissues. But you can go up to 24 hours if the body is uh, gently refrigerated uh, because of the, uh, the fact that obviously the tissue damage is slowed right. down by the cooling process. Sure. That's fascinating. So that the tissues, the tissue that can be donated, it was... Uh, it's skin, so it'd be like outside skin, and then there's bone, I believe. Bone, yes. Any one of your, the bones in your arms or legs, okay, could be used, or even in the pelvis, okay, the bone. <clears throat> then there are muscles attached to that with tendons. Uh, there are blood vessels that can be recovered. Obviously, eyes and corneas are, you know, very well known. That's a, an important source of, you know, Corneal transplant only happens from you can't be a live donor because you're not going to give up your cornea. It has to come from a, a right. tissue donor. And so it's pretty remarkable that we get uh, those many people that we save their eyesight uh, by tissue donation. So tissue donation, again, many, many parts continues to expand. Uh, if you are not a suitable patient to donate your whole heart for transplant, you could be a heart valve tissue donor, okay, which would, if you donate the valve <clears throat> from your heart, then those valves are, are processed and they can be transplanted into people that need a, a replacement valve. Uh, sometimes people say that organ donation is life-saving and tissue donation is life-enhancing, but that's not true. If you're a pediatric patient who has pediatric cardiac disease and needs a valve replacement, you can't put a mechanical valve in a kid because it doesn't grow with them, okay? And right. so that kid's valve would come from a tissue donor, a family that was kind enough to donate their child's heart valves, uh, and we were able to recover them and then transplant them into the child who needs it. Uh, and that valve will actually continue to grow with the child, uh, which is kind of cool. That's amazing. Uh, and the other thing is you talked about skin. Uh, if somebody has a you know massive body burn, they're going to die of overwhelming infection unless they get skin grafts to cover that as a biologic dressing. So right. if you don't get the grafts, you die. If you get the grafts, you might live. And so life-saving, yes, skin grafts yeah. are life-saving. Uh, bowels are life-saving. And a lot of t other tissue is life-enhancing. You know, But any pro quarterback that's out there running around after blowing out their ACL, they have a tissue graft in there to replace that ACL. Uh, and so somebody was kind enough to donate their Achilles tendon or, <clears throat> and that's been used for the reconstruction. So again, that's there's lots of people running around that are tissue, tissue re recipients who don't even sort of think about it sometimes. And is that's is you, rejection, right? Is rejection the same with that? Like with tissue as it is with organs? I'm sorry, so repeat your question. Uh, is rejection sorry. of tissue, like skin, arteries, yeah, most most tissues are actually uh, decellularized, okay, and they, they the body's own tissues actually grow into it, and the cells grow into it. So, you know, the rejection. Most people that get a tissue graft don't need any type of anti-rejection drugs, okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> if you do a face transplant on somebody, however, uh, where you actually transplant the face of one individual onto not somebody else who has their face destroyed by trauma or burns. Uh, that person would need uh, immunosuppression, anti-rejection drugs, because skin, even in the skin graft situation we talked about, the skin actually falls off eventually, okay, because it's rejected by the body. So it's a, more of a biological dressing than a long-term solution. Oh. Your own skin can be, you know, recovered and uh, put over your burn, and that will actually stay on the burn, okay? That will actually heal on the burns. But you only have so much tissue that it can be used if you have an extensive body burn. And so the... Uh, Tissue grafts are uh, temporary dressings, but highly important if you're going to really survive your extensive burn. And you were saying earlier in the pre-interview that you actually have some cadaver tissue, correct? Yeah, I had a, a fusion of my back, and uh, in order to reconstruct them and have those bones fused together, okay, they have to put, they put 
uh, bone taken from cadaveric donors. And, uh, you know, that bone is available on the shelf and it's got a shelf life five or six years uh, so that bone can sit in a little container and uh, be brought out as needed. You don't do any matching. You don't do worry about blood type or anything like that, okay, which we have to worry about in organ transplantation, but not in tissue transplantation. So I was going to say, too, um, the term cadaver, I think, when people hear that term, they don't normally think of that's coming from a, quote, a living body. It's the, uh, but a, cada- a cadaveric transplant, theoretically, is more like a tissue donor. That's somebody who yeah. died, is not on a ventilator, and they are, the tissues are recovered. In okay. theory, the brain-dead organ donor is a cadaver at that point, too, because they're dead. Okay, Even yeah. though they're, their heart is still beating and their lungs are still working because the machine is breathing for them, they are dead legally, uh, just as you are if your heart stops. Uh, and so you can be dead in one of two ways. Your heart can stop and you're cardiac dead, or you can be brain dead because your brain is no longer functioning. And when you do, when you sign up to donate and like you guys all should, if you can, that, um, that also means that you, your, your organs can also be donated or your body like, is, is it, there's, cause there's full body donation, correct? Like for medical purposes, yeah, like whole body donation. saying she wants to be a medical specimen eventually. Whole body donation is a little bit different. Okay. Where you're willing your body to a medical school or something. That's a little bit different. You can be an organ donor and still be a total body donor. You're obviously they're going to, when they do the dissection of your body, they will not find your heart, liver if it got transplanted right. into somebody, but they're, you know, when they do that, having gone through medical school, you're looking at bones of the hands and other things. And so the fact that you may have donated your liver doesn't preclude that you have all those other tissues available to, for them to look at and to dissect and to learn on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's- yeah, I was just, yeah. I didn't know if when you do a whole body donation, like to a, to a medical facility that if it's, if it's pertinent that you have all your, all your, all your pieces together with you. Again, you probably will not be a tissue donor and a full full body donor because depending on what tissues you donate, that may limit the use of that cadaver. Uh, But organs, it's pretty easy. And uh, those are large things. And you don't take all the organs, you just take the ones that have been donated at that point. So you may be missing your liver and have all the other organs intact, depending on what, you know, we recovered from you at the time of your donation. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this before. It's a, it's a weird show. I'm I'm pretty covered in tattoos. So if I were to if 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 something happens to me, and you guys are like, okay, we can grab his skin. I know that they only go so deep. So would it be possible that somebody would have you know tigers and dragons from Craig on them, or how does that work? I'm afraid that you would not be a, t- a skin donor, okay? If you okay. Have okay. Unless there are okay. areas on your body that, that there are no tattoos, but that would be a contraindication to recovering your your skin uh, because okay. of the aesthetics of that, you know, I mean, uh, that maybe they, okay. the person who gets your skin didn't want to have a dragon on their, on their belt. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was always wondering about that too, because when grandpa, uh, he was an old Davy guy and he had a few things on his arms and I didn't, and I obviously... Not to get too far in the weeds here, but I know that when he finally did come back to the funeral home and he was ready to, you know, we did an open casket and everything like that, um, that we, I could notice some things on his limbs that were a little bit different. And I believe that it was something, I think it was a hip bone or a leg or something had been, had been uh, procured. Yeah. The, the recovery of tissue should not impact negatively on your ability to be have an open casket if that's what you wish Uh, we obviously don't do things with the face and you know you have the right to restrict what we recover and so some people say you recover leg bones but you can't recover the arm bones uh, because they want an open casket Uh, and so as far as skin recovery we don't usually take it off the arms because there's not that much skin that you can recover usually it's taken from the back. Uh, so oh, if you don't have any tattoos okay. on your back, then that would be okay. Uh, if you have a bunch of tattoos on your chest or your abdomen, then that area would not be used for skin recovery. So it's more of the back down the legs. Back okay. in the back of the legs and back of the thighs. Yep. Okay. And your buttocks, obviously. So if, uh-huh. if I'm clear nice. there, then that can go somewhere. Okay. So yep. that's something to think about now. Maybe I should slow down what I'm getting maybe because, you know, I want to be, because like I said, I do, Space. There is there is something, I don't know if, Doctor, if you would, you could speak to this at all, but there is something spiritual to the fact that, you know, as humans, we are continuing to give after we do pass on. And I, I, 
like I said, it has made me think more and more about how I treat my own body, my own exercise regimen and things like that, that, you know, hopefully one day the way medical science is somebody can use these things that are in here. And that's, you know, I think it's the ultimate gift, you know, yeah. I mean, but the ultimate gift is to, to save other people's lives with your body parts. Uh, Cause you, as you said before, we're not, you're not going to be using them where you, where you are. So uh, why not let somebody else uh, have the benefit of those organs. Uh, and it's kind of cool. You know, if you think about somebody who gets a liver transplant when they're 70 and that liver came from a 40 year old, that liver is only 40 years old and probably can go on indefinitely. Uh, and that yeah. person, so. It's amazing. I've and your background was as a liver liver specialist first, right? Billieri, I was reading your bio and it said something about that. Uh, well, I did pediatric and adult transplants. The most common reason to transplant a kid is biliary atresia, which is they're born without bile ducts and they have to get a, they get have to get a liver transplant to survive. Wow! And so virtually all the kids that we're transplanting livers on are desperately in need to, to survive and to grow and develop normally. Uh, they really uh, it's a tremendously bad impact on your body not to have a functioning liver. Sure. Cause it filters toxins and does all kinds of other jobs. It's a very busy organ. Yeah. As I, as I say, I'm a big liver guy, as you might imagine. And uh, it's the only organ that has yet to be replaced by a machine of some type. Uh, you yeah. have heart support devices and you have kidneys that you want dialysis and you have insulin for diabetics who have, yeah. and might need a pancreas transplant, but, the liver is going to be a liver. Uh, and, it's you know, too complicated to replicate. It does too many different jobs. It has too many different functions. Everything right. that uh, is going to be replacement for the liver would have to be a biomedical device where you right. actually have liver cells involved with it because you can't process all the other things that, that the liver actually does. Like a computer almost, like with, yeah, the ability to, wow. That's and it's, it's really cool that, uh, you know, when you, a mother can donate the left-hand side of her liver to her child, and that liver stopped growing. It's in an adult. It's not growing anymore. Put it in the child. It wakes up and starts to grow again, okay, and continues to grow with the child. How does that happen? How does that mechanism work? Well, it, uh, somehow the message gets to the cells that it's time to start reproducing again, you know, and so that's – if you have liver cancer and we take out half of your liver – the remaining portion will hypertrophy to essentially replace that area. You don't grow your right side of your liver back, but the left side will get bigger to make sure you have adequate liver to support yourself. That That is absolutely mind-blowing. That is so amazing. So you does that to compensate, whole, yeah. Think about the whole process of transplant, though. I mean, you take a heart out of somebody who has died. Sure. The heart's still beating, and then you stop the heart, and you flush it with cold solution and preservation solutions, uh, and then... You take it into the operating room, take the person's heart out, sew the heart in, zap it to turn it back on again, and it works. Yeah. And they may have been out of the body for five hours. That, uh, so that's crazy. That's pretty magic every time we do this. It's, it's pretty much a miracle as far as I'm concerned that you actually are able to do this business of transporting these organs from a person who died and putting them in people and they live. Uh, when did medical science, when did we have that aha moment that we can do this? When was the beginning for that? Well, like, you know, the early, the early days of transplant were not very good. Uh, yeah, the, I would there were a so. lot of uh, people doing, not a lot, there, there was a selected group of people that were attempting to do this. Uh, the problems were multi, multiple at that point in time. Number one is we didn't really know how to do the operations very well, okay? Number two is you're, you're trying to operate on people who are terribly sick, to put a new organ in them and you're not really that good at putting the organ in at that point in time. So you're trying to, it's almost like you're trying to fail. You, you take somebody who's really sick, do a huge operation on them, and then you put them on anti-rejection drugs, okay, which limits their ability to heal and their ability to fight infection. And it was amazing that anybody survived because the anti-rejection drugs at that point in time were very toxic to the body. And so among the various changes which happened in the techniques of doing the transplant, the medicines that we give to prevent rejection continue to improve over time. So now where rejection is still a problem, it's not completely solved, but it is so much better and so much less toxic to the recipients. That's why the survival rate has gotten so much better and the quality of life is so much better that we used to put kidney, people that got a liver transplant, we'd put them into kidney failure because the drugs were toxic to the kidneys. Mm. Right. Uh, and so again, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul to some extent, uh, but 
that's all in the past. You know, now the expectation is that you do the transplant, the patient does well, and we watch the other systems and we adjust the anti-rejection drugs so that they're the minimal amount to not reject, uh, but not so much that you get toxic from the drugs. Uh, and as we used to say in the early days, you know, you can only do it wrong. You could give too much or too little of the anti-rejection drugs and, uh, and it have complications or you get rejection. So it was a balancing act at those, those times, but I still have contact with people that I transplanted many years ago, and you talked about good stories. When I came to Houston to set up the liver transplant program, I met my now wife, uh, who is a native Houstonian, of which you don't see very many. Uh, they're a rare breed here. <laughs> and she said, uh, I hear you do liver transplants. And I said, yeah. She was like, well, I have a cousin who had a liver transplant. I said, really? Where did she have a transplant? She goes, Pittsburgh. That's where I did my fellowship. And I said, what year? And they said, 1984. I said, well, that was the fellow there. And uh, she had the first combined liver kidney transplant for polycystic kidney and liver disease. She's now 37 years out after her transplant or so. She rides 400-mile bike marathons for fun, and uh, she just got married. Uh, and so she's the longest survivor that I'm aware of uh, of a liver transplant because she came out of that era where most people died and didn't survive or only survived for short periods of time. So that's a pretty cool story that she's there. And when I, I'll tell you, I, I hate to tell a story on myself, but when I met her parents who remembered me very well as the fellow, because I was the one that talked to them all the time and was in, in and around, they said, what I remember most about you is you used to sneak in the room in the middle of the night and steal candy off her table. Okay. And I said, well, was, I was the poor transplant fellow. They didn't feed me, you know, so um, Oh, you needed funny. that sustenance. You needed the chocolate. You needed something. You needed a fix because I was on call all night, you know. And, uh, price, though. <laughs> I mean, I would have been the candy stealer too. That's that's funny. great that everything came full circle. That like <laughs> you were you were you were stealing candy from your future family. Well, I was, at, I was at a wedding. That was pretty cool, you know. So that is very so, cool. That I have to. I, I I mean, I remember reading stories about the early days in the '60s, especially in the Texas Medical Center, obviously with all of our revolutionary doctors we had there that were doing the heart transplants and they were trying Dr. DeBakey, we're pushing the limits of heart transplant. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, that, those, that, that in itself should be a movie one day that should be a big, but that we should, the, the magic of that too. And I know that there was a lot of trial and error with that too, that there were some people that would get a, a heart, transplant and not live, you know, but a few months, a few weeks. And then, you know, the, even the early, the early failure is, you know, there were moratoriums placed on organ transplants in various locations just because the results were not very good. And so, but they continued to strive through that process and they developed the techniques. And that's the reason we have the success we have today was what they did as the pioneering work uh, back in the early days. What's, what does the future look like for, for life gift and for your, your line of work? What's, what's the next frontier, I guess you're working on? Well, we're working on, you know, better ways to preserve the organs. Uh, you know, if you take a heart out, you only have a limited amount of time. You can keep it out of the body before you have to put it in. Well, what if we could put it on a machine and it could go three days while we found the right recipient for it, or we watched it get better on the machine than it was doing in the person. Uh, so there are, perfusion devices that actually use blood and they have warm oxygenated blood going into that organ, uh, which will preserve it for longer periods of time. The problem is the technology is uh, still in its infancy and the cost is e extreme, you know, of course, you know, a lot of money to put a, an organ on a machine. Whereas if you put it right in, you don't have to put it on the machine and you can get good results with that. So better preservation is always, uh, is always something we're looking at, you know, preserving the organs longer new techniques on how to recover the organs more expeditiously uh, in, the, in the person that's donating, continuing to maximize those individuals in the ICU who are brain injured to make sure that we keep them in the best possible shape in the hopes that they'll get better and go home. Uh, but if they don't and they go on to become brain dead, they will be a better donor at that point in time with better organ function and less time spent resuscitating those organs so that we can uh, recover them and transplant them successfully. Uh, and the ultimate future is you, ha you need a liver transplant. So we do a liver biopsy on you. We bring it to the lab and we grow you a new liver yeah, uh, or a new kidney. Yep. They've, grown, they've grown bladders. They've grown tracheas. They've grown a number of things in the lab. Okay. And at some point in time, we will be growing your own organ. And the beauty of that would be that you wouldn't need anti-rejection drugs because right. it would be your own tissues. 
Your DNA matched totally. It's, 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 it's nothing, because it's, it's, and it's a sim it's a similar circumstance to transplanting identical twins. The first successful transplant for kidney was done between a pair of identical twins, and the reason that it was successful was they didn't need anti the, the one the recipient didn't need anti rejection drugs because they had the same HLA matching uh, uh, as their twin brother, and uh, that was something that I uh, say. We didn't, if you survived the operation, we might kill you with the anti-rejection drugs, and that person didn't need anti-rejection drugs. So, again, better immunosuppression is continue, it continues to be something that we need to continue to work on. But growing the organs in the lab is the ultimate on this. Uh, and, you know, if we could grow islet cells in the, in the lab, those are the cells responsible for producing insulin, we could avoid doing pancreas transplants and just inject cells into somebody's liver and uh, that's done now, but in that circumstance of growing them in the lab, they would not have the same level of re possible rejection uh, if they were grown in the lab. And many generations of those cells would lose their uh, immunogen immunogenicity, meaning how likely the body is to recognize them as false. So, so how far away are we from being able to do that? Well, I th I've been thinking that they're going to be able to do that, you know, any time now for the last uh, 20 years, and they're still not there yet, so... It's it's ongoing, you know, uh, 3D printing of organs, you know, uh, you know, it's all that. There's a lot of discussion about that. So, you know, this is a never, never stagnant field. Ever. Some people are always trying to make uh, do new things and new innovative things to allow more people to be transplanted. Because, again, the waiting list is 120,000 people. Uh, we do about 37,000 transplants a year. Uh, so there's a huge gap between those who are on the waiting list and those who are actually getting transplanted. And as I mentioned, uh, it's a death sentence if you don't get your organ transplant. And imagine that drives a lot of innovation for the people who are truly passionate about what you do because they see it, right? And so therefore, those wheels are always turning and they're always looking for something, you know. The other thing that we need to harp on a little bit is living donation, because uh, you mentioned that before. The best way to get a kidney transplant is from a live donor. Not only does a kidney do better, but you don't have to linger on the waiting list for five years waiting for a cadaveric kidney transplant to become available to you. You can have your transplant next Thursday or you know a, week, a month from now because it's all arranged and it's an elective procedure. Uh, and the morbidity or the problems with the, the donor have diminished greatly over time. And now most of these are done with a laparoscope. So the, the donor stays in the hospital maybe overnight, maybe an extra day. But, you know, the old days of two weeks in the hospital after you donated your kidney are gone away. And so <clears throat> we really push the living donation side of things. There's an increasing number of living liver transplants uh, being done where you take half of the liver out or a third of the liver out uh, and transplant it, uh, especially in patients with tumors or other things where they are not likely to get a cadaveric liver because they're not that sick, but they're dying of their tumor. Uh, and so getting a living donor allows them to get transplanted before they, the tumor spreads or grows while they're on the waiting list. So uh, fascinating fields, fascinating stuff going on all the time. How do you get on the list to, to, be, to, to raise your hand and say, I'd like to donate a kidney or I'd like to donate part of my liver? Yeah. Is that... In most cases, the person is evaluated for kidney transplant, and then they're approached by the, the transplant program to ask them if they have anybody who might be a potential donor. And it's very well controlled because we want to make sure there's no coercion of uh, forcing grandma to give you her kidney, okay, by making her feel bad. And, you know, yeah. that works. So we act, they actually have advocates for the donor that make sure that they are doing this out of the goodness of their heart and they're not being coerced into doing it. So I assume it's usually <laughs> but, family. I would like well, a family. But, or... but, but if you decided today that you wanted to help somebody, you could go to Methodist or to St. Luke's or to Herman and say, I want to be a living donor. And it's called an altruistic liver donor, I mean, a kidney donor, uh, where you don't care where the kidney goes, okay? You're not expecting anything back from that, okay? And so that you can be a, a kidney donor, they would work you up, make sure you're not cuckoo, uh, you know, that you're not doing this because you think you're going to save the world or something, you know, but you wanted to help somebody, you know you, don't, you only need one kidney, and so you're willing to do that. Uh, and they would then match you with somebody on the waiting list that needs a kidney transplant. The more fascinating thing is that it makes sense to do that. That's a nice thing to do, and uh, but it's not real common. It usually is somebody related to you. But the, the cool thing that goes on in kidneys now are that if you 
have a wife or a loved one that wants to be a donor, but they're the wrong blood type. So they're perfect donor, but they don't match your blood type. Then you can go on a list where there are what's called paired exchanges. So Mr. Smith's wife wants to donate, but she's the wrong blood type, but she's the right blood type for you. And his kidney could go to you. You can go that. The, I think the largest number of paired donations that happened as a, a kind of a domino effect was like 22 <laughs> different people got transplanted uh, by matching the kidney with somebody else who wasn't the original donor. But and then you get you get the reward of getting a kidney because your donor gave the, somebody else a kidney. So that's ingenious. It's really cool when they do that. It's really an ingenious it's, system. It really is. It's like one of those. It's like one of those crazy convoluted NBA trades where you send Absolutely. somebody yeah, to, yeah. And, a player, <laughs> and a kidney to be named later. Yeah, you send somebody to Atlanta. You said you're going to get. That's that that really, that's it really is cool. And you know, but you know, there may be ten kidney transplants going on simultaneously. That's, yeah. They're all interconnected. All this is mind blowing though. Where does totally. Houston match up when it comes to this? Like, are we, is this a medical center? And like I said, the, the medical I've, center is engaged in that on a daily basis. You know, I mean, they don't do it every day, but I mean, they are constantly looking to get more living donors done. Uh, okay. And so any way they can do that with the paired exchanges or with a relative or with an altruistic donor. So, I mean, it, it really is uh, important to try to get these people off dialysis and back to a quality of life. Dialysis is great. People survive, but it's not a great quality of life. Okay. Being hooked up to a machine for, you know, hours and hours uh, every third day or something, you know, so we want to get them back to being uh, healthy and be able to do what they want. How does, uh, how does COVID match up with all this that's going on now? And over the past year, I'm sure that it's just been, it occupies about, you know, 75% of my time, I think, is dealing with COVID issues. When COVID first hit the uh, hospitals, they actually cut way back on the number of transplants they were doing, especially living donor transplants, because that's an elective operation. And when the hospitals were overflowing with COVID patients, there were no beds in the ICUs. And so doing elective kidney transplants was kind of put on the back burner temporarily while they sorted this whole thing out. <clears throat> Every transplant patient was at risk, okay, because they're immunosuppressed. Their immune system is not as good as somebody who's not on anti-rejection drugs. So all of those patients were wor very worrisome, and they didn't want – they couldn't really come to clinic because they didn't want to be in the hospital where all the COVID patients were. And so lots of impact on the transplant programs. As far as organ donation goes, for a period of time for organ and tissue donation, anybody being COVID positive was ruled out as a potential tissue donor or potential organ donor just – automatically because no one understood anything about this virus that was fl flopping around there. And so no one was willing to take the risk of transmitting the virus from the donor to the recipient and killing a recipient because we gave them COVID with their kidney or with their liver or with their lungs. <clears throat> it has morphed at this point in time to being even more complex because now we are starting to use organs from people who have had COVID in the past because it makes sense that if they're over their COVID infection and they have antibodies, then they have a catastrophic neurologic injury, why wouldn't they be a suitable donor? Uh, but it becomes a little more complex because some of these people are tested and they still are testing positive, but it's thought that it's a dead virus. They're, they're right. far enough out from their original infection that probably they have no live virus in their body, but there are still some virus particles floating around and may make the test positive. Right. Well, how do we know that's not a real infection? You know, we really don't enti know entirely. So we have to balance the risk benefit of recovering those organs, potentially transplanting them. Uh, and it continues to evolve. What do you do with somebody who was exposed to their wife who tested positive for COVID yesterday, and then they have a neurologic injury, but they have no symptoms of COVID, you know, but they had exposure. So, you know, so I spend a lot of times, and we are so concerned about this that we actually get three of us together to talk about every case so that we make decisions based on the best facts that are available. Uh, and recently, there was a white paper that came out uh, from all of the major transplant societies and organ procurement agencies and basically reviewed all the data that exists, which is very limited, but said, these are the recommendations. You know, if you're 21 days out from your infection, less than 50 days, you can probably be a donor. 
The reason they say 50 days is if you're still testing positive at 50 days, it's probably a reinfection right. uh, in that circumstance. So that's why that, they put that limit on it. And the rest of it is all kind of witchcraft. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, what do we do with that person who had mild COVID symptoms, tested positive, but they all they had the sniffles? Right. You know, do we have to wait 21 days on that person or could we only wait 10 days on that person if they, they died in a manner to become an organ donor? So we're continuing to learn every single day. And, uh, you know, with all the people that are in hospitals dying of COVID, we have recovered kidneys from two people that were on actually on ECMO where their lungs had been destroyed. Right. And with, with COVID, people don't die of the actual infection. They die primarily of the immune response that as you try to kill the virus in that person's lungs, you kill their lungs to do that. Uh, and many of these people are not infected anymore. They're dying of end-stage lung disease. And there's actually been, I don't know, probably a dozen double lung transplants done on people who have recovered recovered from COVID in all their other body systems except their lungs. And they'll never get off the ventilator. And the lungs were crazy. I mean, like healthy, healthy versus those lungs that they took out were shocking. Oh, totally shocking. Bad. I mean, just they're... They look like they're Swiss cheese or something, you know. I mean, that's really what the, the yeah. lungs are soft and pliable and nice and pink, not not in somebody with COVID. Yeah, we just had um, the Body Worlds exhibit at the museum not too long ago. We finally wrapped it up. And uh, I know that it was very, very eye-opening for a lot of people to see, you know, smokers' lungs versus, you know, non-smokers' lungs, yeah. that kind of thing. And we also touched on COVID as well during that, you know, just in the importance of keeping, of keeping, uh, keeping your body, you know, tip top shape. Um, you mentioned something a minute ago and strange question. You, you mentioned neurological damage, things like that. Are we ever going to get to a point where I hate saying this, but where we can start, we can start implanting back and forth with, stuff with the brain and neurological, or is that something we were never going to, we're never going to tackle? You know, it's an ethical dilemma of what okay. you would do in that circumstance. The other problem is you have to hook the brain up to the spinal cord somehow. And, you know, the, the, once, once something happens where you get a neurologic injury and you're a quadriplegic and they can fix your spinal cord and make those nerves regrow and, you know, then maybe we can think about the rest of the brain. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, we can. <laughs> putting a brain in somebody who's a, a high quadriplegic doesn't sound like a very good quality of life, even though they might survive. Uh, I just so, know somebody was going to ask that, that, like, are we that far down the line? I'm not, I, I was think, trying to be creepy or anything, but no, I, just, creepy. I mean, it's, it's yeah. reality, you know, I mean, there are several, you know, great old, horrible, you know, uh, movies where they have the brain in the, you know, and floating in the water. And uh, yeah. I think we're a ways away from that, uh, you know, but uh, once we can repair spinal cords, then we can think about what we're going to do with the brain because it doesn't do much good to have a brain and not have any function uh, at that yeah. point. Right. Well, that's so interesting that you, yeah. that, that we're, and who knows in 50 years where we'll be with any of this stuff, with any of the, don the any of the, the donation stuff, um, it's really exciting. And like I said, I know I'm on the list. I think Johnny's on the list, uh, our silent partner today. Um, I know Kat's on the list. Kat's going to get her. She's just going to donate everything. I am. I'm and, sure. uh, I'll I donate whatever lots. I'll donate, whatever I can. And I'm going to try to, uh, Johnny said, yes, he is a donor. There we go. And awesome. We encourage everybody to find out number one, if you're on that list, check your license, go online, do it because it's so important and it's easy. Yeah. And like if there's wor working with uh, the medical museum to potentially partner with them to have a kiosk or something in there where we can have people sign up on the registry there. Uh, and so just in discussions at this point in time, but anything we can do to get more people on the registry mm -hmm. uh, it's about 17 million uh, Texans on the list. Uh, interesting statistic, 52% of adults in this country are on a donor registry somewhere, which sounds great. It's a lot, but 48% are not. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, right. There's so a in that problem. circumstance, you know, we need to have everybody sign up. I mean, why, right. we, is it like, more, why, why would you get the vaccine? Why wouldn't you sign up to be a donor? Uh, is it but, more of a, is it a, is it a sometimes a religious thing with people or is it more of a, they just don't have enough education to understand that it's, that it's possible. None of the major religions has said no to donation. They all have supported it as a concept. Uh, and uh, the Pope actually said it was the ultimate gift 
uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, what, like Jesus gave his life and uh, people give their organs, I mean, and, and save people, what could be a greater gift? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's misinformation, you know, there's the old, uh, if I have a, a, a heart on my driver's license, when they come into the emergency room, they're not going to take care of me and they're going to make me a donor. Right. Uh, that's, that's so far-fetched that it doesn't really warrant discussion. But the reality is the team that's involved with caring for you cannot be involved with the donation process. Okay. Right. You know, we don't do brain death testing. We don't do any of that. <laughs> so we're not involved in that process. Uh, their ultimate goal is to save you. I mean, yes. everybody that comes in, they want to save. And that's the, that's the goal. And so uh, that's a myth that uh, we've tried to debunk. Uh, and I think it, a lot of it otherwise is education. You know, I mean, uh, we need to get out there. We need to get uh, the, ma- the ministers and the priests and the rabbis and everybody else saying that this is what you need to do. Uh, and do make like it blood drives. Like yeah, blood drive and organ drive. drive. That's donation too. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, and we work with Brian Gannon is the head of, over at Gulf Coast, and we work with him, uh, you know, because it's all about donation. So, yeah, we uh, had but, the last fall uh, when Body Worlds opened up. We did uh, every week or so. We did a blood drive actually at the museum inside the Grand Hall. I was one of the first people that donated. I rolled up. I you know I showed off. You know, I, and um, you know they even ended up telling me that. I think a, a day later or so that my blood was somewhere in the medical center pumping through somebody else's body. I saved four, or I, you know, I helped four other people, five other people. And that's just, it's a, that is living. And that is definitely, it's something that, you know, we can always do. I know that when we were talking about that, there were so many myths and, you know, rumors that we had to dispel even about blood donation, you know, something you think would be so simple, and obviously COVID, you know, sort of throws a wrench into those plans, but it's such an easy thing to do. I know a lot of people are scared of needles, but guys, you're helping somebody you're, you're doing, you would want somebody to be doing it for you. You know, it's not like it's, you know, they're going to stab you 50 times. uh, (laughs) But next time think about having an organ donation drive at the museum. Yeah, exactly. I'm happy to work with you on it because that's, you know, we need more people on the registry. It just makes the whole process that I mentioned at the beginning of our talk is that it makes the whole process simple and it takes that, that burden off your family to make the decision whether you're going to be a donor or not. Uh, well, we do have some interesting things coming to the museum soon, and I think we will be talking to a few of your cohorts over there to try to set something up. Wink, wink. I think we're going to work on something. I know we are. I'm going to make sure it happens. And uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day, Dr. Wood. And uh, Kat, I want to say something. This is probably, I always learn something, right? No matter who I talk to that we, we involve are involved with, but I have to say this was probably one of the most eye opening ones. You think, you know, something, but there's so much going on that I didn't know about. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And you know, I'm, if you guys ever want to call me or you have (laughs) people call in with questions today that uh, in reaction to this, uh, you know, I'm, be happy to come back on uh, you know you mentioned education it's education 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 you know that's really what it's all about and uh, people we want people to make an informed decision about becoming a donor uh, and the only way they, they can do that is to have the facts to make their decision that they want to help somebody else but uh, 100 so percent agree with that mm-hmm. yep. again our goal is to offer hope to those people that are desperately in need of a transplant and those families that have suffered a catastrophic loss uh, by having them help the grieve by knowing that they saved a bunch of lives. I personally think that we should have like a Vietnam Memorial for the organ donors because they're the true heroes in the country that save lives. Uh, and, you know, they should all be recognized uh, by some type of memorial. So, Yeah. There's, I, I think uh, I, it, some of the best, I guess the best memorial we have for now is just those people walking around with some, with, you know, somebody else's <laughs> heart or somebody else's, I know I was just thinking about it. If I think about it enough, I'll probably start, getting misty eyed, but I know there's a, there's by now, there's probably a 13 year old kid out there running around with one of my grandpa's organs. And that makes me really, uh, whew, yeah, it makes me, makes me happy. So I try to a lot of kids and I get some of them come back to see me and they're getting married or they finished college <laughs> and that's pretty cool. That's very cool. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Wood. Uh, we're going to wrap this up before I start crying full, full, <laughs> full, uh, full waterworks over here on the zoom. Thank you very much uh, for uh, hanging out with us. And uh, we're going to put the URL over there. So everybody go forth and sign up to be an Oregon donor. You could be saving.
tons of lives and you're going to be making people a lot happier and you're going to be expanding somebody else's life. Donate Life Texas. Very easy. Thanks, Doc. Here we go. Thank you, guys. Have a great day, guys. You too. Bye-bye.